from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ronald Thapar, Thapar, we are very happy to welcome back to the Kluge Center. She was recently with us in December to, to receive the Kluge Prize for Lifetime Achievement in the Study of Humanity, which she shared with uh, Peter Brown of, of Princeton University, who will be, uh, like Dr. Thapar, returning to, uh, for a lecture uh, later uh, next month. Um, her lecture, which is being sponsored by the Kluge Center, is on the topic, Perceptions of the Past in Early India. Um, she is indeed the preeminent historian of early India. She was a pioneer in opening the study of that rich, ancient civilization, really, more, uh, which she helps us to think of as a continent rather than as just a country. Um, and opening up its study to inquiry and to new conceptual frameworks arising out of the modern social sciences. She formulated a whole set of new questions about social development covering nearly 2,000 years of Indian history. She challenged the existing ways of looking at uh, Indian history uh, that were common or were uh, characteristic of both of the um, colonial historians, European colonial historians, and more recently, uh, nationalistic extremists uh, uh, within, within India itself. So she's rewritten the history of the entire subcontinent, the history uh, not just of India, but of India, which was almost indistinguishable in terms of its borders from Pakistan, from Afghanistan, from other countries of the entire subcontinent. In her inquiries, she's drawn her materials from multiple sources, multiple languages, and considered all levels of, all levels of society um, and traced across a very broad expanse of time. Faced with the absence of reliable dating, she's found new information in ancient texts, Persian, Arabic, Sanskrit, Jain, in old Tamil, Tamil traditions and folklore, integrated all of these manuscript sources with findings from archaeology, numismatics, linguistics, and inscriptions. So it's a really Herculean task that she's been performing. And she's persistently championed a history that's, first of all, grounded in evidence as best can be discerned. Um, but it creates cumulatively, I think, an appreciation of an India that has accommodated civilizational diversity, been a crossroads of all kinds of different linguistic and cultural ethnic influences, and it suggests that the past is not just a process of, uh, from authoritarian past to the democratic future, but a past that has in itself a rich um, a pluralism and a rich uh, variety and, and, and many um, peaceful moments rather than just a s series of conflicts. Anyhow, um, it's not been without controversy, um, and she herself acknowledges the uncertainties involved in writing history in the absence of a reliable written record of an accepted narrative from which uh, all things can be taken, modified, but never um, uh, strayed all that far. Her work and that of like-minded colleagues has profoundly changed the way India's past is understood, both in home and abroad, both within the academy and within the schools. She's had an enormous effect on textbooks, which is rarely the case of someone who is such an excellent, um, detailed uh, professional historian for specialists. She's the Emeritus Professor of Ancient Indian History at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. She saw visiting posts received honorary degrees from universities on three continents. She's written and co-authored 15 substantial books beginning in 1962 with Ahsoka and the Decline of the Maurya, and including the 1969 classic A History of India. When she revised it in 2004 into early India from the origins to AD 1300, 
she really had an effect written in no book because she is continuously enriching, uh, revising, perfecting, is a model of a historian of ancient times with modern sensibilities and a thorough uh, grounding in a wide variety of disciplines. So it's a great honor and pleasure for me to present to you all in, uh, the winner of last year's uh, Kluge Prize for the Study of Humanity, Dr. Romola Thapar. Thank you, Dr. Billington. Thank you very much indeed for that very generous introduction. Um, generous to the point where I feel I don't really deserve it, but thank you indeed. It's a great honor for me to be here. It's a great pleasure for me to come back to the Library of Congress. I'm familiar now with the corridors and the rooms and the procedures, and it's like a kind of homecoming. Um, I wondered what I should speak about today and decided that I should probably best speak about the work that I'm currently doing, which is basically an attempt to try and recognize historical traditions in ancient or early India. This is, I must warn you, a very complicated subject, and it is also a very controversial subject. But I think it is a subject that does need attention, which is indeed why I have for many years been working on it. And it is a subject that also needs to be analyzed as it has never been done before. So that I am treating my research as a kind of beginning study, which I hope many other scholars will take up and do in greater detail. A couple of hundred years ago, it was stated that Indian civilization was unique in that it lacked historical writing and implicitly a sense of history. With rare exceptions, there has been little attempt since to examine this generalization, and it is taken as axiomatic. I would like to suggest that while in the early period of Indian history, there may not be historical writing of a conventional form familiar to us from Europe, there are nevertheless many texts that reflect historical consciousness. These came to be reformulated as historical traditions, and later, in the first and second millennia AD, this was reflected in distinctive forms that approximate historical writing. My primary intention is to argue that irrespective of the question of the presence or absence of historical writing as such, an understanding of the way in which the past is perceived, recorded, and used affords insights into early Indian society, as indeed it does in any other society. It is worth investigating what was written and why, what were the dialogues and debates that occasioned this writing, and ascertaining the degree of historicity would be a subsequent step. Societies need to construct a past, or even many pasts, for these have social functions. Such constructions claimed that what they narrated happened in the past, a claim that differentiates them from fiction. Such narratives observe a chronology and a sequential order. This is a starting point, as it were, of historical consciousness. Communities have constantly to situate themselves in relation to the perceived past, 
which becomes a permanent dimension of social identity. Although its construction, form, and content might change with new definitions of identity. This is sometimes demonstrated in variant readings of the past which indicate plurality. It becomes particularly apparent when there is an official version that differs from other versions and is appropriated by those in authority. New demands on power and legitimacy change existing forms. Thus, conventional history a couple of centuries ago was closely tied to nationalism, which tends to tidy up variety, preferably into a single identity within the nation. The recognition of possible pluralities in constructing the past is a recent idea. My concern, therefore, is not with whether or not early Indian society produced a specific historical literature of the conventional kind to record the past, but rather with trying to understand the variety of texts that purport to represent the past. This involves many questions why they took the form they did, what from the past was of relevance to their authors, and why particular types of records were maintained. And my idea at the back of my mind is always that of the range and possibility of differences and not trying to stereotype every record into one kind of system. It seems to me that three aspects need inquiry. I would first like to ask why it was necessary to argue that Indian civilization lacked a sense of history. This was largely a colonial argument with an emphasis that derived both from the way enlightenment thinking defined history, but more so from the requirements of colonial policy. The second question is to recognize that historical traditions emanating from diverse cultures will inevitably differ. And comparisons of world cultures have to be much more precise than they have tended to be so far. And the third aspect, which is in, in effect the most substantial, is to inquire into the nature of the representation of the past in texts linked to the early Indian historical tradition. The search for indigenous histories of early India began in the late 18th century. European scholars, conscious by now of historical literature, as a distinct category, recording the past, as was the case in, the case in Europe at that time, looked in vain for recognizable histories from the Sanskrit tradition. Indian culture, and particularly the Sanskrit articulation of what came to be called Hindu culture, was defined, therefore, as ahistorical. William Jones, the leading Indologist of the late 18th century, suspected that some texts, even if including the myths and legends of the Hindus, probably contained the core of a history. Most scholars tended to disagree. But even Jones quotes only one example, the famous Rajatarangani of Kalhana, written in the 12th century AD as acceptable historical writing. A century later, MacDonald's searing remark that early India wrote no history because it never made any was modified by others such as Rapson, who granted the making of history but regretted the absence of a systematic record. Comparisons with the Chinese chronicles of Suma Shen and the Arabic writings of Ibn Khaldun, or even the biblical genealogies, not to mention Greco-Roman texts, 
strengthened if only in contrast the axiom of Indian society denying history. Such comparisons made no reference to the historiographical contexts of all these other histories. The officers of the East India Company derived their data on law and religion from their Brahman informants. The centrality of the text important to Vedic Brahmanism therefore had priority. These texts were the Dharma Shastras, the social codes, the normative texts, the Vedas as religious, the earliest religious texts, and to a less, lesser extent, those known as the Purans, the last of which they regarded as second order knowledge. They were later and dealt with more popular religion. Other systems of knowledge, such as the Buddhist and the Jain, assessed as inferior branches of Hinduism were initially given little importance. That these, in earlier times, might have been alternate systems of knowledge was hardly conceded. Prominence was given to a limited upper caste perspective. There was little attempt at discourse with their Brahman informants on the wider context of the text and their authors. Other theories emerged from the European excitement at discovering what many believed might be an oriental renaissance, bringing innovative knowledge similar to the earlier revival of classical European learning. That religion and mysticism were characteristic of Indian culture to the virtual exclusion of rational ways of organizing knowledge was reinforced in German Romanticism. The argument that in India, caste viewed as civil society overwhelmed the state further underlined the view that without a state there could be no history. And for Hegel, therefore, India was a land without recorded history. A different construction of Indian history in the 19th century drew on other premises deriving from utilitarian thought. This underpinned the requirements of colonial policy in a changing relationship between the colonial power and the colony. A denial of a sense of history was implicit in the theory of Oriental despotism, which was articulated at length in what became the hegemonic text on Indian history, James Mill's The History of British India, uh, which, was be which uh, began to be written in 1818 and continued throughout the 19th century as the major text. Mill's view was seminal to arguing that Indian society was static, registering no change, and therefore had no use for recording the past one of the functions of the past being to legitimize the present, if used correctly. This stasis could only be broken by British administration legislating change and thus introducing the notion of history. Mill's history was defining a new idiom for imperial control. The argument was that if the past is eliminated, then despotic power cannot be accused of violating tradition, nor can any appeal be made to thwart despotism in the name of the past. History was a record of change and progress was its teleology. India's endemic despotism, governed by custom rather than law, and lacking rationality as the motivating force represented, it was said, the reverse of progress. Since neither law nor rationality prevailed, history too was absent. The absence of history had the practical advantage of allowing the formulation of a history for the colony that would underpin colonial policy.
Colonial attitudes to knowledge pertaining to their colonies assumed that such knowledge was a form of control. Thus, William Jones writes of the Itihasas and the Purans as being in our power. And decades later, Lord Curzon came up with his famous sta statement that the intellectual discovery of the Orient was the necessary furniture of empire. History was the portal to knowledge about the colony. This would be enhanced if it could be maintained that even the awareness of the colony's past had to be provided by the colonial power. Assisting this process was the almost obsessive concern with the Orient being necessarily the other of Europe. Statements on otherness were foremost in Karl Marx and Max Weber. Part of the otherness lay in a lack of transition to capitalism, which Weber attributed to a failure of economic rationalism. It was also attributed to a denial of a sense of history as emphatically maintained by Marx. Meanwhile, throughout the 19th century, the collection of manuscripts and artifacts for the reconstruction of Indian history continued apace. Equally impressive were the results from the decipherment of the ancient Brahmi script, which revealed the new resource of epigraphic data. Archaeological excavations revealed antiquities which provided the tangible evidence of history. However, in the reconstruction and interpretation of the larger flow of history, European models and preconceptions hovered, and comparisons with Europe were unavoidable. But the comparisons, even, were superficial, and the changing historiography of European history, as is evident from the 19th century, was ignored by colonial historians. The nature of history being discussed with intellectual intensity in 19th century Europe made little impact on Indologists and colonial historians. And for historians of European history, the past of the non-European world was another country. Indian historians, by and large, initially subscribed to the colonial view and accepted that Indian society was ahistorical. Insightful discussions tended to be limited to single genres of texts rather than historiography. The existence or not of a historical tradition in early India has been the subject of passing comments in recent times. One argument is that a historical tradition did exist, but that it was a weak tradition. And despite high intellectual levels in other aspects of thought, it never developed into a major tradition. This has been attributed to the decentralized nature of political institutions, to the role of the Brahmins, the priestly elite, in fabricating genealogies for rulers, and to the exclusive control of the priestly elite over the transmission of the tradition. Another explanation points to the bifurcation between the keepers of state records largely the scribal castes, the caestes as they're often referred to, and the priestly elite, the Brahmins, from whom a critical intellectual assessment might have been expected, but didn't emerge. More defensive views maintain that history as a discipline has been formatted through modernization, and Indian civilization has been unconcerned with this. Such explanations are hardly adequate, particularly in light of recent historical research, which has questioned the earlier stereotypes. 
It is evident now that Indian society was not static and was subject to change. The nature of such change was not uniform in time and space. This constitutes a radically different view of the Indian past. Change is a nodal point in history when new identities can emerge and the past can be reformulated for the purposes of the present. Two processes of change continued through the centuries. The first was the mutation of clan societies into castes as part of a bigger change of assimilation into a state, generally a kingdom. Kin relations ceased to be crucial to the pattern of polities. Social hierarchy was introduced as also was differentiated access to resources. The second change was the transformation of early kingdoms of a simple, non-complex type into more complex state systems. Interestingly, both processes are reflected in various genres of texts that are referred to as the Itihasa Puran tradition, the words that are used in particularly the Sanskrit literature for a historical tradition. This becomes apparent in the references to the polities, economies, and patterns of social control, aspects that have tended to be neglected because of the focus largely on religious history. Some texts represent historical change in a covert manner, others do so more openly. But before I speak about historical consciousness, I would like to consider the second aspect that I mentioned earlier. This concerns our present day changed understanding of history itself, the discipline of history. In this, the focus on historiography, the context of the writing of history has been central. And let me go back a bit in time to the Enlightenment to explain this. History as defined by the Enlightenment was thought of as central to civilization. Every branch of knowledge had to have a history. A people without history were a people without knowledge. The history of civilizations also derived from humanist traditions which maintained that there was a unified European identity with continuity from the Greeks to modern Europe and was accessible in European literature. There emerged from this a rather literal view of Greco-Roman historical writing and a susceptibility to treating ancient narrative accounts as invariably historical. There were at the time no analytical studies such as those which have recently re-examined Greek and Roman historical writing, or for that matter, much of the writing from many other ancient societies. These have pointed to the interweaving of fiction and history in the representation of the past. It has been said, and here I quote, if one starts by distinguishing between oriental or mythical or mythologizing historiography and a rational and scientific historiography which strictly sticks to sources and facts, it is questionable whether Thucydides can be counted among the latter. This may be too harsh a judgment, but Herodotus was frequently accused of lying by his contemporaries, perhaps because he drew heavily on oral tradition which they could not consult. Later writers such as Manetho and Plutarch questioned many of the statements of Herodotus. History was a narrative of persons and events, some recalled from the past, through oral and written sources, and some witnessed in the present. Parallel to the late Greco-Roman notion of history 
was the altogether different Jewish tradition antecedent to the Christian. The Greco-Roman notion was virtually set aside with the coming of history infused with Ju Judeo-Christian views. This began with Jerome and culminated in Augustine. History was no longer just a narrative of the past. It was now the record of the power of God and of Christ as reflected in the actions of the Christian church. This was a departure which was contrasted in Renaissance writing, drawing on Greek and Latin texts. It took a more secular form with the Enlightenment explanation of human activity being the pivot of society. Historiography became decisive to Europe with the Judeo-Christian religions claiming the historicity of person and events. History also provided a community identity for the nations of Europe as they emerged in recent centuries. The change in European historiography needs underlining. Generalizations can hardly be made about the single unified sense of history of the West. In Europe, the change was from the Greco-Roman to medieval Christianity to the Enlightenment, each born of different historiographies and formulating diverse historical tradition. Some attempts were made to reorient Greco-Roman ideas. Arnaldo Momigliano, the great classical historian, writes, that Greek models became transformed into a Jewish apocalypse. Clearly, historical consciousness is understood in present times in a different sense from a century or two ago. Islamic historiography is also treated as uniform and seen from the perspective of religious texts. Yet, there are distinct ideological variations that gave shape to the writings that emerged. The Arab discourse was imprinted with facets of Judaism and Christianity, even if what eventually emerged was the distinctive ideology of Islam. The Persians internalized their legacy of Zoroastrianism and Manichaeism. The difference within the Islamic tradition is apparent if one compares the representation of the past in Firdausi's Shahnameh or the writings of the Ghaznavid uh, scribe by Haki with the Arab Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah. Such diversity would have produced histories with variable nuances. The historiography most frequently taken as a measure of historical writing is the Judeo-Christian. This has a clear eschatology, narrating the beginning and the end of humankind, with a teleology built into it, and time is seen as linear. The others where this is not so evident are the Greco-Roman, the Chinese, and the Indian. The Greeks had virtually no eschatology, and in the other two traditions it was not definitive. Time takes various forms in these traditions, linear, spiral, and cyclic. The Greco-Roman is treated as foundational to European historiography, yet it has little in the way of common premises with the Judeo-Christian. We now recognize that history lies not just in a sequential narrative set in a chronological framework, but also in inquiry and explanation. This implies that a comment on the presence or absence of a sense of history in a particular society also requires some familiarity with the genres of texts incorporating historical consciousness. These are not identical across its constituent cultures. The way a narrative 
the way a narrative relating the past is formulated reflects not just a curiosity about the past, but with how it explains the past, as well as the concerns of the time when it was composed. This draws from the political economies and religious ideological concerns that had currency at that time. The form of the narrative changes when these change, and therefore there is more than one genre of text encapsulating the past. The context is what allows us today to observe the complexities of the past looking at its own earlier past. Essential to history is the shape and accounting of time. Much has been made of the lack of history in India being tied to a cyclic concept of time, an insistence which continues despite research to the contrary. This is contrasted with the linear time of the Semitic tradition, which is said to provide a necessary factor for historical thinking. Yet, Linear time in India is manifested in the extensive incorporation of genealogies, and even more so in the shift in astronomy from lunar to solar reckoning. With this, chronology becomes more precise as in the use of the samvat, the era, and calculations based on eras enter historical records. This is from about the second century BC onwards. Stating in detail the time of an action is particularly essential to recording gifts of land as is evident in many inscriptions intended for this purpose. A sharp dichotomy between linear and cyclic time is not feasible since some elements of each are often parallel, although pertaining to different functions. Even in cyclic time, the present is not a repetition of the past, as has been maintained. Each cycle records change, as is evident from the eschatology of the four ages in Puranic and Buddhist cosmology. Let me now turn the focus away from the rather dog-eared arguments about the absence of historical writing and consider what I regard as the more relevant question, namely how the past was perceived and recorded in early India. Answers to this question, even if partial, might provide insights into early Indian history. And that is the main thrust of my argument, that by looking at the way in which early societies looked at their past, we begin to get insights into how these early societies functioned. The early Indian historical tradition has two distinctly different historiographies. One emerges from what might be called a Puranic framework, often associated with Hinduism. This draws on ideologies deriving from Vedic Brahmanism, and the emergence of new sects and social movements of the first millennium AD, closely associated with what we now call Hinduism. Historical traditions, as I hope to show, are encapsulated in texts called the Purans. The second historiography draws from the ideologies which evolved from a questioning of, if not opposition to, Brahmanism. This is often labeled as Shramanic, from the word Shramana, referring to Buddhist and Jain monks. The ideological underlining of each of these would therefore be different, as is reflected in the choice and representation of events and personalities that each highlight from the past. Alternate positions which, although not always stated as such, are nevertheless reflected in diverse formulations or in contradictions. The two terms associated either separately or conjointly with traditions relating to the past are itihasa 
and Purana. Itihasa literally means, thus indeed it was, and has come to be used now to mean history. But earlier it was not history in any modern sense of the term. It was merely a reference to what was believed to have happened in the past. Puran refers to that which belongs to ancient times and includes a medley of events and stories believed to go back to the early past and some that we would now call myths. The origins of the Puranic framework of the Itihasa Puran tradition go back to forms that are embedded in various texts, such as the Rig Veda which dates back to the second millennium BC. There's a category of hymns in the Rig Veda known as the Dana Stuti hymns, literally hymns in praise of gift giving. They have hardly any ritual function and one often wonders why they were included in an essentially ritual text. They are in praise of contemporary heroes and chiefs of clans for their generosity in giving gifts to the composers of the hymns, which were made usually in celebration of a successful cattle raid. Association with the sacrificial ritual perhaps gave these hymns greater credence and certainly ensured their continuity. And the poets that compose them frequently talk about how they are giving immortality to the rajas, the chiefs, and they are indeed, they did indeed give them immortality because we know of them now because of these hymns. Heroic acts involving raids and skirmishes are enlarged in the epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, which move from multiple raids to one formal devastating battle. The epics are not averse to innovative features, since the appeal to the past can be to fix a precedent for action in the present. This is an appeal which still exists. The Mahabharata as Itihasa was used on occasion for this purpose, namely to legitimize the induction of hitherto unknown clans and their social custom. It was said that they were a part of the earlier society. The central narrative, however, is the confrontation between the clans, um, a story familiar from many epics. The Ramayana, on the other hand, differs in as much as the conflict is between not two equally matched clans, but a newly emerging kingdom at Ayodhya and the clan society of Lanka, where the latter is demonized as the famous Rakshasa. Interestingly, both epics are recited at a sacrificial ritual, although as, uh, almost as if the earlier tradition was being continued, even if the compositions themselves were not initially the ritual texts that they were converted into later. But essentially the important point is that the epic texts is, as historical texts are really talking about clan conflict. The embedded history in these texts relates to clan societies and registers the gradual coming of kingdoms. The authors are looking back nostalgically to the past. Perhaps for historical purposes, this might have been the function that had priority. Persons and events gave form to remembering this past, and the past that's remembered is much bigger than just persons and events. Historicity of person and event, however, would be of less concern where the intention was rather to evoke a past society. Such an evocation is common to epic forms. Composed as oral traditions, they are currently seen as repositories of historical consciousness, whereas a century ago, societies without literacy were said to be without history. <laughs>
This was the raw material that was reformulated into a long distance view of the past as in a section of the Purans referred to as the Vamsha Anucharita, the succession lists. Earlier, scattered material was drawn together and a pattern was worked out. It was marked by distinctive phases in the mapping of the lineages and their genealogies and therefore of the past. The lineages and genealogies have various functions and are carefully mapped. It becomes a data bank for those in later times wishing to latch themselves onto a lineage and thereby claim the aristocratic status of being Kshatriyas, which many did. It was not intended to be counted literally generation by generation, nor to be interpreted as racial identities, as has been done by some modern historians. The listing of clans in this record are succeeded by a sequence of dynasties and the rulers of each of these. This change represented the mutation to kingdoms. The list began with dynasties of the 6th century BC, continuing up to the Guptas of the 4th century AD. These are largely historically attested dynasties, such as the Nandas, the Mauryas, the Shungas, the Andras, and the Guptas, and so on. Another indicator of the transition from clan to kingdom was the change from the Kshatriya lineages, the lineages of aristocratic status, to non-Kshatriya dynasties, the latter frequently being members of the lower castes. The legitimacy of kin relations among clan chiefs had been undermined by upstarts of low status, appropriating power through changing the polity from chiefship to kingship where obscure families acquired status with the help of a priestly elite. These families in return provided patronage to the priestly elite and in theory supported the orthodox social codes. From the perspective of the Itihasa Puran tradition, the Gupta period starting from about the fourth century AD marks a watershed between history that is what I call embedded, that is not primarily written as history but included in ritual texts, and differs from the articulation of the historical tradition in the post-Gupta period, which is reflected in new, specifically historical genres of texts, what might be called history in embodied forms and I make this distinction between embedded history and embodied history, where I argue that embodied history has its own genres of literature. The occasion is now the court and not a ritual or a gathering of the clan. Historical consciousness is made apparent in other more striking ways, for example, in the reuse of objects from the past known to have had a historical value. The most dramatic example of such reuse is the pillar erected by the Mauryan Emperor Ashok in the third century BC, now located in the Allahabad fort in northern India. It carries a series of inscriptions of Ashok and one particular series that talks about his ethics of tolerance and nonviolence, particularly nonviolence. It carries a series of inscriptions of Ashok as also a long eulogy on the military campaigns of the Gupta king, Samudragupta, ruling 700 years later in the fourth century AD. It's the same pillar that has these two inscriptions. And yet another inscription giving the genealogy of the Mughal emperor Jahangir of the early 17th century AD. Evidently there was a perception of the pillar encapsulating history and the legit legitimacy that history provides. Hence the deliberate choice of the same pillar 
even though the reasons for eulogizing Samudra Gupta's military campaigns were contrary to the nonviolent ethics of the Ashokan edicts, uh, all on the same pillar. The construction of the past now moved at this time out of the chrysalis of embedded form and came to be expressed in genres that were newly created as specifically historical texts. These were the charitas or biographies of kings and ministers, the vamshavalis or regional chronicles, and on a much larger and wider scale, the royal inscriptions, some of which are in effect dynastic annals. The change of forms, information on authorship, and distinct ideological perspectives signal the importance of the historical tradition to post-Gupta society. This is society after about the fifth century AD. There is awareness of sources in varying degrees of the specificities of space and time and of the significance of the past. What was earlier subterranean now surfaces and takes a visible form. Kingdoms, of which there were many more in this period, were being transformed into complex state systems. Their take on the past was necessarily different from before. A new form of kingship was symbolic of the polity, requiring additional mechanisms of legitimacy and representations of state power. Kings are occasionally said to be incarnations of deity. But even as such, there were not even a pale shadow of the articulation of divine will as in other historiographies. Incarnations did not direct events. They shored up the claims of the ruler. And this is a very fundamental difference. The role of human agency remains primary. The biographies are con of contemporary kings, uh, the biographies are of contemporary kings, but include the historical antecedents of both the subject of the biography and the author. The focus is on a particular problem. For example, in the Harsha Charit written by Bhana Bhatta in the seventh century on the famous king Harshavardhana, the focus is on the ways in which Harshavardhana acquired sovereignty of the central part of northern India. And it was not just by military campaigns, and that is the interesting uh, aspect of this biography. Similarly, another biography of an eastern Indian ruler, Ramapala, the biography called Ramacharita, is about how he defends himself against his feudatories who are all in confederation and attacking him, and gives an absolutely magnificent picture of feudal society, as it were, in India in the 11th, 12th centuries AD. The intention is, in these biographies, to give the official version justifying the king's action. New powers claimed by kingship in new societies are being invoked. And if they're giving the official version, one inevitably asks the question, why are they doing so? Who was, in fact, critiquing them that they required this official version? Inscriptions, especially those recording grants of land, have their own format. Uh, there is one section very commonly referred to as the prashasti, the eulogy of the ruler. In Sanskrit, it's largely formulaic. The opening benediction is followed by the origins and achievements of the dynasty and the reigning king and the qualifications of the donor to whom uh, land is being granted. Genealogies move from desirable links to actual descent. Some statements are rhetoric, but much is acceptable historical narrative, set for the most part in a precise chronology. The section of the inscription in the regional language, which is not in Sanskrit, addresses aspects of the donation and the local administration, obviously meant for the local administration. They provide us with indicators of how the system worked at lower levels. 
The Vamshavali or Chronicle, of which the finest example is the 12th century Raja Tarangali of Kalhana, was the document establishing the legitimacy of the kingdom and of its rulers. As such chronicles were composed in various kingdoms, coinciding with the process of regions becoming acculturated to mainstream Sanskritic culture, some continued to be updated up to recent centuries. I think the, the, the last updating of some chronicles was done in the early 17th century. Origins tend to be linked to the Puranic descent lists, but there is much that accounts for persons and events, largely of the past and some of the present, and provides a perspective of the history of the region. There are val these are valuable in tracing the process of state formation and the establishing of kingdoms, which is in fact what these chronicles were actually doing. They were less concerned with recording people and events and much more concerned with recording the processes of historical uh, change. As a genre of historical writing, they continue into the regional languages when chronicles become a necessity in a newly established kingdom. These perceptions were predictably different in the parallel historiography in Jain and Buddhist writing, although the difference narrows in later times. Texts from the Buddhist and Jain tradition sometimes contested the representation from Brahman authorship. For example, the earliest Jain version of the story of Ram was Vimala Suri's Paumacharyam of around the third century AD. Not only did it contradict the Valmiki version, but insisted on its own historicity. A political dialogue is implied in these contradictions. The choice of subject in later Jain biographies and chronicles highlights those who were their patrons, and the style is not too dissimilar from other biographies and chronicles. Both his narratives of the history of Sri Lanka in the Deepavamsa and the Mahavamsa of the fifth and sixth centuries AD begin with the earliest kingdoms in the Ganges plain and continue till the end of the Mauryan Empire in the second century BC. The Indian link is because of the Buddhist connection. These chronicles have a different focus on events and personalities as compared to the more Hindu Puranic tradition. For example, the Mauryan Emperor Ashok is a mere name in the Puranic king list because he was a Buddhist and did not patronize the Puranic religious sects. But in these Buddhist chronicles, he is both powerful as an emperor and the most important patron of the Buddhist Sangha or order. The reason for the difference is ideological. The Sangha's attempt to ensure authority included correlating the succession of monastic elders to successive rulers. These heterodox traditions, as they have been called, have a sharper understanding of the centrality of a historical perspective. The reasons can be many. Literacy for them meant not only copying the Buddhist or Jain canon, but many other kinds of writing. This included commentaries on the canon, monastic chronicles which record sectarian activities, including dissidents, as well as the biographies of the founders and elders who were historical figures. Records of the properties of the monasteries had also to be maintained. Events were generally, generally related to the central date commanding their chronology, the date of the Mahaparinirvan, the death of the Buddha, in the case, to, case of the Buddhist texts. A new and distinctive kind of historical consciousness emerges with all these changes of form. Some links with the embedded tradition are present, but their role is different. These were forms that continued into later medieval times. <clears throat> 
inscriptions, biographies, and chronicles used by court chroniclers and authors speaking for institutions of authority continue in Persian, as indeed they also continue in Sanskrit and the regional languages in the second millennium AD. All these texts can be looked at afresh and in a comparative way because historians are now turning to themes which had earlier been precluded from history. It is recognized that groups in society have their own versions of history which reflect the perceptions of their past as viewed by particular authors. Even what we regard as a fabricated version claiming to be historical is of historiographical interest. Fabrication is often the rhetoric of ideology, as indeed it is also an attempt to bypass the problematic. Therefore, the reason for the fabrication has to be sought. Any codification of the past tends to be selective. The reasons for making a particular selection are significant. The historical tradition in its Puranic, Shramanic, and other forms come to constitute the core of the constituents of historical thinking. A heroic phase moved to a courtly phase, or a king had an interface with the Sangha. The ideology of the Buddhist and Jain perspective was different from the Puranic, although some of the data could overlap. In looking at the Itihasa Puran, or historical tradition, my intention is not to try and reinstate an indigenous interpretation of early Indian history, or to argue that there is an authentic version of Indian history, an Indian view of India in such sources. This would be a present day imposition on the past. I am arguing that an awareness of the perceptions which earlier authors had of their past could be a way of illuminating our understanding of that earlier society. Such perceptions would relate to the creation of variable identities, to social hierarchies of dominance and subordination that involved differentiated access to resources and to claims of status. It is for us as historians to explore the manner in which these early writings record and explain the processes of historical change as perceived by their authors. Such an interrogation of earlier traditions might help us recognize the nature of historical consciousness that went into the making of historical traditions and in some instances of historical writing. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thapa will uh, accept some questions from the audience, um, and please wait for the microphone. Yeah. Fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, before you uh, talked about this embedded and embodied uh, uh, histories, uh, you mentioned about rationality and enlightenment. And uh, uh, I think that's one of the most important uh, themes that we don't seem to ex uh, explore as much in the sense that Western historiography, that enlightenment must precede modernity. And, and when in fact, uh, even Russia, Japan, all uh, so many countries and uh, societies never really went through so-called enlightenment. And yet, they had to struggle painfully because they felt they have to wrestle with enlightenment and become modern. So you, since you mentioned that, uh, I wonder if you could explain a little bit further about the Indian situation. 
Well, uh, what I was really trying to emphasize was the fact that, um, in a sense, the kind of history which, until recent years, we regarded as good conventional history was something that came out of the Enlightenment. And therefore, uh, to look for that kind of history in societies that did not go through the process of the Enlightenment was really, in a sense, a negative exercise. Uh, the next question then is, were there other forms of histories that these societies had which we could look at in terms of how they saw their past, how they put it together, and the degree to which this is really historical writing per se. And this is, this is what I was trying to develop in terms of the Indian data, uh, that even at a time when we didn't go through this process of enlightenment, uh, we still had writing that related to the past, and we still had writing that I think, for example, in some cases can be called historical writing. Now, of course, the thing is that these days, uh, in the post-Enlightenment age, um, there, there, are many, um, there are many intellectual trends that would deny the importance of uh, Enlightenment history. Um, I can't say that I'm too sympathetic to all these trends. I think that we have learned a certain amount from the kinds of emphases they have given. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I guess I'm old fashioned. Wait for the mic, please. How, in simple terms, would you describe the way in which your vast and variegated exploration of this long period uh, changes? the sense of modern India's um, identity from either the old colonial view or the new hyper-nationalist view? What are the main two or three things that, that really uh, are, are different about the identity affecting modern India, admitting that's only part of your canvas, which is much broader, the whole subcontinent? But what, what, how, how does this affect, or should it affect, uh, and has it, because of your great influence in textbooks as well as uh, general deep probes, how has that changed the sense of modern India's uh, growing sense of identity? We are conscious in this country of enormous changes in technology and various things, but what about the sense of Indians um, I know it's difficult to generalize, but uh, somebody who has your depth of knowledge would be fascinating to know what that sort of new sense of identity would be that follows from your investigations or is suggested by them. Well, let me begin by saying that um, the sense of identity changes as one changes one's understanding of one's past. Historical changes do bring about changes of identity. And what we're facing at the moment in India really is a choice of two identities. One is an identity which draws very much from an extremist position that argues that the real essence of Indian culture lies in religion and lies in Hinduism, which is then defined and of course all isms are always redefined for whatever purpose they are needed. Uh, so there is a new definition of Hinduism that comes into this. And then there are other groups of people who say, well, there was much more to the past than religion. Whatever the religion may be, it could be Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Muslim, Christian, Sikh, or whatever it is. Um, and what one is trying to suggest is that let's look at these other categories as well. Let's look at how society was organized. Let me give you one example that, you know, we were brought up to believe that caste was rigid. That once you were born into a particular caste or, you know, whatever the caste was, it had a status in a hierarchy and you, that couldn't be changed. And then when you start looking at historical texts, you find that the status of 
certain castes that were low was somehow made high. And the historian then says, now wait a minute, how did this happen? And so you go into doing a historical analysis of how this happened. And this has been a very major contribution that a lot of the historians from the 1960s onwards have made, sociologists, social anthropologists, historians all together. Uh, now, this becomes important, for example, in present-day India, where you have a conflict going on between lower castes and upper castes, or at least certainly a desire of lower castes to aspire to better status. Now, if they know of a history and they know that this is not something that existed uh, eternally from the very beginning, that there were other ways in which people in the past did make a change to their social status, it does create a difference. It doesn't become something that is destined, as it were. It does give people a sense of, well, you know, let's see how we can do it and what is it that we need to do in order to make that change. And the same kind of thing would apply to other aspects of life as well. Um, basically, it's really a question of, um, or at least let me say that I think about it in terms of what is the identity of the Indian citizen. And for me, the identity of the Indian citizen, I feel, should draw much more from all these texts that I've been talking about and all these changes, you know, clan-based, kin-based, caste-based, to kingdoms, to states, to realize that there was an immense change taking place right through the centuries. It was not a static society. To realize... Um, that you had varieties of societies and that there were lots of changes that took place. Societies themselves underwent change. There were other societies that came and confederated and there were changes and so on. So it's the openness and the plurality of the past which is very important. And I think that for today's India, that is the major message that we get from all these texts, that is, the need for plurality and openness. Um, at the time that you're talking about history, early Indian history, the concept of India must have been very strange because there is no concept of India at the time that you are talking about the history. It's more a, a, a mosaic of vernacular happenings and events that and were- states. And states. And states. And states. I mean, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm a little yeah. confused right now between clans and embodied forms and embedded <laughs> forms. But, Sorry. But then I'm, I'm, I'm not a scholar <clears throat> in your field. I'm just a lay, lay person, a scientist, really. But it's always bothered me that the concept of India, which is really a modern concept, is absolutely and totally artificial. And it blurs the differences between different um, conglomerates on the Indian subcontinent that had their own history, their own wonderful thing, and the study of Indian history is not as important as it is to understand the history of these little bits and pieces, the mosaics that make up an artificial India. And, and to this day, we're struggling with different pieces of India that want to take off in different directions. But we always tell ourselves, we are Indians, we love each other, and we should all be in the same place. But is that historical reality? Uh, in in well, your studies, did you see that? Yes, the historical reality is not that there is a single history and every Indian stands by it. Uh, there is a single broad sweep of history that one might, might, may accept, but there is definitely, there are regional variations, and we have to learn to understand these regional variations and come to terms with it. But on the business of uh, was there an India then, the point is that all nation states are recent developments. I mean, any nation state that you take today is at most 200 years old. So that's not surprising. That's not at all surprising. This is... Well, the the, the, that was critical. Yes, but that was not a, not, that was not a nationalist concept. That was much more a civilizational concept. In the same way you can say there was a concept of, of uh, 
belonging to the caste group or whatever it may be, which was much broader than the individual kingdom. Uh, that was certainly there. Uh, b but that was, that was not a nationalist concept. And, and that's my problem with this, no, the idea that, you know, why can't we take India all the way back? Or when does India begin and what was there? What was there was before was the multiplicity of kingdoms. Um, and um, well, in, in the Indian case, what was there before and what is there even now is the whole gamut of life and society from food gatherers to IT specialists. And that for me is something terribly exciting, challenging, difficult to work with. And this has been the case all along. We've had a variety of societies. And so even when, when I'm talking, for example, when I'm writing about the Mauryan Empire, um, when I wrote my PhD 50 what odd years ago, it was a centralized bureaucratic empire because everybody only talked about centralized kingdoms in India. And then 20 years ago, I sat down and looked at the problem again and started talking about differentiated administrations because you had some areas that were clearly centralized, there were others that were not, and the others which were forest tribes over whom no one had any control to the point where even to this day, the control is pretty dicey. So one is talking about an extremely complex society and I was trying to underline the fact that one isn't talking about the history of a nation. One is talking about the history of a variety of societies. And all that I'm trying to do is to say, let us go into all these regions, pick up the texts from these regions, and then see what we are being told about the regions and which regions are in conversation and dialogue with, with which other reasons and why. I think we'll just have one uh, last question, and um, uh, Dr. Dean? Oh, there's another, okay. We'll do two questions, but that'll be it. <laughs> would, you, would you please comment about uh, the clandestine discovery of Kautila's Arthashastra and the politics around it? Sorry, just... Uh, I, I, I was just curious to find out the clandestine discovery of Kautila's Arthashastra and the politics around that time, how did it impact the historiography? The clandestine discovery. It wasn't very clandestine. You know, uh, it, the point is that a lot of the early manuscripts, lay, some lay in uh, Marx and um, what would be the equivalent today of libraries and monasteries and so on. Others lay in people's homes. They were in private hands. So some manuscripts would turn up when the interest at the turn of the century became one where everybody was looking for manuscripts. And so it wasn't a clandestine discovery. It, it was just a very pleasant discovery that this thing, this document, this manuscript came up. Uh, the politics were really not very acute. The, uh, the, the nationalist opinion was very excited because colonial scholarship had gone on saying, oh, um, Indians are all spiritual and religious and don't care for anything else and they have no sense of how to organize their lives and how to make their lives productive. And here you had a text that talked about nothing but how to organize your life and make it productive and how to run a government in the best possible uh, centralized fashion so that there was a lot of excitement that in a sense the, the past of India had been somehow set right by this text. Okay, just one last question. Um, and, 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 right. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I, as you mentioned something which, which I thought was, was, uh, was very exciting, you talked about well, history can be written in many ways. It's the great man history, the, the dynasties, and so on. But also the concept of linearity, chronological linear, and then you talked about the circular. And I was wondering if this is rooted in um, 
theological philosophy in a way, because you talk about a semantic tradition, which is chronological, and in a way, a person is born, suffers, and dies, but that's the end of it. Uh, the Indian tradition is more is richer in a way because there is a reincarnation, there is a return, so that perhaps this circular concept uh, uh, that you that you mentioned could be rooted in uh, well in the religion or philosophy as you wanted to say because because life continues but in an, in another way, whilst the Semitic tradition um, ends at a certain point in in a man's life in a dynasty's life. So I was wondering if you would comment yeah, on this. Yeah, well, there, there are actually two views on that, um, the cosmology of circular time. Uh, one is, as you said, that if everything is a question of rebirth and it'll all come back and so on, then the cycle of time will also return. And so this feeds into the notion of rebirth. The other is, of course, the figures, which are very interesting. Um, the entire cycle, of the, the entire full cycle of four smaller cycles pulled together have, uh, the, the, the main figure is the same as the one that was used in Sumerian astronomy and was then somehow reached, uh, Indian astronomy used it, used it as well. One is not allowed to say it was then borrowed, but anyway. Uh, but the interesting thing is that as the figures went on being discussed, there's, there's a lot of dialogue, it seems, between the writers of the cosmology and the astronomers. And they sometimes decide on the same figures, and they sometimes don't. And it is thought that the figures were extremely large because the astronomers, in their theories, used, had to have larger figures. But the interesting thing is, and the reason why we think there was this dialogue is that most astronomers use the same figures as are given in the cosmology uh, scheme. But there is one very famous astronomer, Aryabhatta, who is possibly the best astronomer that, that, that Indian civilization produced, who doesn't use the same figures. He uses a different set of figures. Uh, but clearly there was some give and take in this situation and possibly the authors of the Purans were borrowing the figures from the astronomers, or at least that's what I would like to think, but that may be a very rational way of looking at it. Um, and the reason for that would simply be that, you know, you prove that the cosmology is correct because the astronomers are saying the same thing and so it sort of reinforces it. I would like to invite you to please uh, thank Dr. Thapar for a wonderful uh, lecture. <laughs> and please uh, join us all for continued conversation and a little bit of food and libation in the back. Thank you very much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.